This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their awesome all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More about them in just a bit. One of the greatest acts of exploration the world has ever seen took 13 years to complete, and yet it discovered no new lands, nor did it scour the depths of the oceans or search the vastness of space. This was an exploration that focused on the very essence of who we, as humans are. The Human Genome Project was not as dazzling as the Apollo mission to the moon in 1969 or as earth-conquering as the first summiting of Mount Everest in 1953, but it was one of the most important pieces of research that our species has ever undertaken. The project to map the human genome, our DNA, began in October 1990 and was completed in April 2003, and for the very first time we were then able to look at the complete Homo sapien blueprint. Even 18 years on, it remains one of the largest collaborative biological projects that the world has ever seen, with 20 separate institutions across four continents taking part. This was very much a team achievement. But really, the mapping of our genome, that was just the beginning. Now that we have the blueprints, we can further our understanding of topics ranging from molecular medicine to human evolution. The Human Genome Project itself didn't change the world, but in years to come, we may well look back on it as the start of something very special. Let's start with the human genome. Every organism has a genome, which is a complete set of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. This is a chemical compound containing genetic information and instructions to develop and direct activities within that living organism. You are probably familiar with the image of the double helix of DNA, and even if you don't know exactly what it is, you'll probably associate that image and be like, that's DNA. The double helix represents the structure of a DNA molecule composed of two twisting paired strands. These strands themselves consist of four chemical units called nucleotide bases, adenine A, thymine T, guanine G, and cytosine C. These bases always pair with a base on the opposite strand, and always the same one, so an A always pairs with a T, and a C always with a G. These are all bonded together with hydrogen atoms and set around the sugar phosphate backbone which forms the structural framework of this molecule. Now we are of course talking about absolutely minute size here. One study focusing on human DNA found that the chain measured 2.2 to 2.6 nanometers and one nucleotide measured 0.33 nanometers in length. And to put nanometers in some kind of perspective, a banana has a diameter of roughly 40 million nanometers. That's around 4 centimeters. However, if you could stretch the DNA in one cell as far as it could go, it would measure roughly 2 meters, while all the DNA in our cells combined would be about twice the diameter of the solar system. That's around 574 billion kilometers. The human genome has just over 3 billion of these base pairs, which can be found in the 23 pairs of chromosomes found in the human body. This DNA contains all the biological, evolutionary, and genetic instructions for development, functioning, growth, and reproduction. Every single living being has it, and most viruses do as well. This is essentially a map of living beings, where they've come from, who they are, and indeed where they might be going. A Swiss physician by the name of Friedrich Miescher was the first to isolate DNA back in 1869. As with many early groundbreaking medical findings, there was a slice of luck involved here, with Miescher first citing the microscopic substance in the pus of discarded surgical bandages. Our understanding of DNA grew steadily, but rather slowly, over the next 75 years, culminating in 1953 with the first accurate model of DNA, the famed double helix set out by Francis Crick and James Watson. The story the story goes that on the 28th of February 1953, Crick stood proudly in the centre of the Eagle Pub in Cambridge at lunchtime to announce that he and Watson had discovered the secret of life. Nearly a decade later, they and a colleague, Maurice Wilkins, won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their groundbreaking work. 
Now, if you're looking to break ground on your very own web project, it's time to have a look at the powerful suite of tools offered by our friends over at Squarespace. This is a creative time for many aspiring business owners and creatives. They're reaching deep into the savings account to start a new business of some kind, or maybe just launch a blog to share their opinion with friends and neighbors. The world really is yours, and Squarespace is the perfect web tool to help you fashion it into whatever you'd like it to be. It's the platform to use when you're ready to get started on that web project that you you've been thinking about. You're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Well, use one of their quick and beautiful templates to make a website that's fresh and for you, like it's right out of the box. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person. You've got lots of opinions and ideas about what exactly your site should look like. Squarespace gives you all of the customization options you could ever want with no updates, no patches, no technical BS to worry about. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design if you're so inclined, or maybe just playing around with the colors, there are so many extra features that Squarespace provides so that your website can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. It's everything you could ever want all in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash mega projects and you'll save 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to the world of DNA. It wasn't until 1985 that serious discussions surrounding the sequencing of DNA began. Much of this originated in the United States, which came with advantages and disadvantages in the early stages. The potential financial clout to have the only real remaining superpower on board was vital. I know the Soviet Union didn't collapse for another six years, but let's be honest, at this point it was in freefall and more concerned with an unwinnable war in Afghanistan rather than human genetics. But the US agencies initially involved, the Department of Energy and the National Institute of Health, needed to convince a skeptical public, and indeed many skeptics in government, about the importance of sequencing DNA. As soon as financial estimates emerged that included the word billions with a B, many outside the scientific community quickly labeled it as a waste of time and money. For many, it was difficult to see the immediate benefit, and considering that 18 years after the completion of the sequencing, we've still only just begun to scratch the surface of what might be achievable, you can certainly see their reasoning. But as I mentioned earlier, the Human Genome Project was never designed as a short-term wonder achievement, but rather the keys to the much larger Pandora's box that is human DNA. Then there's the touchy topic of genetic manipulation and genetic discrimination, both of which were still a long way off considering the mapping hadn't even begun. But they were points that were raised nonetheless, and it wasn't until 1986, after a long and difficult process, that pieces of this extraordinary biological project began to fall into place. <laughs> Now, it was another four years until the project was officially announced by the Department of Energy and the National Institute of Health as a $3 billion project adjusted for inflation that comes into around $5 billion. This included almost unparalleled collaboration around the world involving geneticists in the USA, the UK, France, Germany, Australia, China, and Japan. The project itself was divided into two phases, the shotgun phase and the finishing phase. You can probably guess in which order they came. The shotgun phase had three different steps. One, obtaining a DNA clone to sequence, two, sequencing the DNA clone, and three, assembling sequence data from multiple clones to determine overlap and establish a contiguous sequence. Before any sequencing could begin, geneticists needed human DNA. Now, you might be wondering how exactly they were able to map human DNA. After all, aren't we all unique human beings? Well, the answer to that is yes, but also no. Yes, in that no two humans are exactly alike, even identical twins will have tiny variants, but considering that we all share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA, we can broadly say that we're actually all kind of the same. The project used the DNA from four or five anonymous donors, so we'll never know who the Human Genome Project is technically based on, and 
it's probably just easier to say that it's based on all of us. Firstly, geneticists divided human chromosomes into DNA segments of an appropriate size. These were then subdivided into even smaller fragments that overlapped with one another. And here's where the long, arduous process of sequencing DNA really begins. Sequencing involves a process known as electrophoresis, which separates pieces of DNA that differ in length by only one base. This is done by placing the sampled DNA onto a gelatin-like substance and placing electrodes at either end. When an electric current is applied, it causes the DNA molecules to move through the gel. The smaller the molecules, the faster they move, so this process separates the bands according to their size. Unfortunately, this is a painstakingly slow process, as electrophoresis can only separate about 500 bases into clear bands, which explains why they needed to be chopped up so small and probably why it took 13 years to complete. And that's with the help of machines. It's estimated that a human doing this work might be able to produce a finished sequence of 20 to 50,000 bases in a single year, whereas a machine could do it in just a few hours. The latest advancements in sequencing machines involves the first fully automated capillary sequences, which use a robotic arm to do most of the work that humans once did. This is an incredibly complex process and we could talk for hours about it, but most likely you'd all begin to doze off and my viewer retention graph on YouTube would look something like this. But I'll finish with one more point before we move on to talk about the finishing stage. These machines that sequence the DNA can't really see the DNA directly. To remedy this, geneticists need to use fluorescent dyes which correspond to the four different DNA bases. But before any electrophoresis races can even begin, the DNA is first copied several times and divided into four batches. These batches are then copied again, but with a small amount of chemically modified base added to each batch so that each batch contains either modified T, A, C, or G. When these are added, the chain bases stop growing, which leaves batches of DNA that contain only one of the DNA letters. In the second round of copying, fluorescent dyes are added, blue, red, yellow, and green, which all correspond to a DNA letter. The four batches are then sent through a sequencing machine, and as they emerge and move through the gel, a small laser illuminates the molecules and their color. This is then read by the machine, which begins to match colors and DNA letters until it has a rough draft sequence of that particular part of DNA. And well, what does it look like? Well, far less visually interesting than you might think because it's basically just the same four letters and the same four colors over and over again. If you thought the shotgun phase sounded long and arduous, the finishing phase could take even longer. The first stage of this process provided a huge amount of hard data, but there were plenty of gaps, 147,821 gaps to be exact, and there also could have been mistakes that may have arisen due to machine or human error. The finishing phase focused on filling in these gaps, while also correcting any obvious errors. This was done by 16 different genome centers around the world, and it took several years to complete. This resulted in 99% of the human genome being mapped in its final form, containing roughly 3 billion nucleotides and only 341 gaps. And these gaps remain for a little while. For the purists out there, this might leave a nagging sense of incompletion, but essentially the technology used to sequence DNA could not always be used effectively, especially in highly repetitive sequences. We have one sequence inside our chromosome centromeres that is 171 repeated letters, which scientists often describe as being like a stutter. We don't really know what it is, why it repeats, and we certainly didn't have the technology to sequence it accurately back in the 1990s. Things have improved now, and as of 2015, the number of gaps was down to 160. A rough draft of the sequencing project was unveiled jointly by President Bill Clinton and Prime Minister Tony Blair in 2000, but the project wasn't officially declared complete until April 2003. Three years earlier, President Clinton had declared that the gene information gathered would remain patent-free, which no doubt was music to the ears of those who feared a chaotic genetic free-for-all, but bad news for a company called Celera, a private institution who had also been working on the sequencing at a much faster rate than the Human Genome Project because it was using data taken from from the project. Solera's stock immediately plummeted, and the biotechnology sector lost about $50 billion in market capitalization in just two days. If private companies were dreaming of making a killing off mapping the human genome, well, that dream was well and truly over.
So after all that sequencing and all of those years, what did we discover? Some of the most striking findings came with how similar we are to other animals and other things in our world. Remember how your teacher used to say that we're essentially all the same as a chimpanzee? Well, they're pretty spot on. Technically, we're 96% identical to our evolutionary cousins, which is quite amazing when you think about it. What's also amazing is that we share 70% of our DNA with a slug and 50% of our DNA with a banana. That's right, I suppose we're all half banana or half human, depending on how you look at it. It also found that significant disease can be caused by a single nucleotide change in a single gene rather than on a larger scale, as had been previously thought. This has hugely improved our understanding of the molecular mechanisms involved in human diseases. The project also revealed that we have around 22,300 protein coding genes inside of us, and this is where much of the work has been done after the Human Genome Project. These protein coding genes account for just 1% of our genes, with the remaining 99% categorized as non-coding genes. And you can probably guess which are more important. Non-coding genes do not provide instructions for making proteins, and for a long time they were considered virtually useless. However, through the findings from the Human Genome Project, we've been able to paint a much clearer picture of these genes, and in particular, how they help to regulate protein coding genes, and often determine when and where genes are turned on and off. As I mentioned earlier, the project found that we have roughly 6 billion base pairs of DNA. Now, that's certainly a big number, but think of it like this. If you were to type 8 hours a day at 60 words per minute, it would take around 50 years for you to type the whole human genome. If people thought back in the 1980s that the successful sequencing of the human genome would immediately lead to a barrage of new discoveries and groundbreaking advancements in medicine, well, they were severely disappointed. One point to be clear here is that much of the hype that came with the Human Genome Project decades ago came from the hyperactive media, shocking, who often made grand claims that this was the first step to a major advancement of the human race. And there is still a good chance that that will be the case, but what many fail to point out is that it will likely take decades of work before any major revelations or life-changing findings appear. While mapping the human genome was an extraordinary achievement. It is but the first step in a long journey. We now have a hugely complex blueprint of human DNA, but that doesn't immediately equate to medical breakthroughs. If anything, the hard part is just beginning. We now have a map. We just need to understand what it all means. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please do give it a like down below. Thanks again to Squarespace for the sponsorship. And also, one last thing, if you like these more serious topics, please do check out another channel I host called Explored. I'll also link to that below. It tackles more worldly topics like genomics in a more traditional documentary style. And thanks again for watching.